Amy Deschamps was born in 1948 in the city of Perth Amboy, New Jersey. She had a sad childhood due to the sudden loss of her parents at only nine years old. She was raised by her aunt and uncle. At 17, she married her high school sweetheart. At that same time, she opened a carpet cleaning business and shortly after got divorced. She then started dating older, successful men only, one always richer than the previous. A few years and two other divorces later, in 1992, at the age 45, Amy decided to start her life over and move to Las Vegas. She bought a new apartment and reopened her carpet cleaning business, hiring two employees, a longtime friend named Claudia Meckler and a man she had met at a casino named Wayne Jones, 58, whose nickname was Bobby. She soon got two big contracts with Scenic Airlines and MGM Grant. Living in Vegas, Amy discovered a new favorite hobby, poker. It was on a poker night at a casino called Mirage that she met 46-year-old Rose Charles Weinstein, a professional poker player born and raised in Liberty City, New York. His family had been in the gambling business for over 20 years. He was also a bookmaker, a person that accepts and pays off bets on sporting and other events at agreed upon odds. In his case, not only the legal ones. Their relationship began professionally when he hired the services of her company. Shortly thereafter, they started dating and quickly decided to move in together to a Spanish-style mini-mansion that Bruce had recently purchased. As a husband, Bruce liked to give Amy gifts and did so very often. He even gave her a diamond necklace and a turquoise Chevy Camaro, which he bought her a few weeks after they started dating. Amy seemed to make Bruce very happy. Even his family was happy for him. He was a diabetic and Amy made sure he ate right every single day. When they first met, he weighed almost 300 pounds and with Amy's care and help, he lost 42 pounds. This greatly pleased Bruce's mother, Sylvia White, who developed a great deal of sympathy for Amy. She was very close with Bruce and there was not a day they didn't speak to each other. No matter what or where, Bruce always followed the routine of calling her at 6 p.m. Las Vegas time to pass on the gambling information. In the business he ran, it was necessary to set the bet in line every day. However, at 6 p.m. of July 5, 1996, Sylvia's phone didn't ring. Worried, she called Bruce and Amy was the one who answered the phone. She told Sylvia that Bruce had left the night before around 11 p.m. and still hadn't returned. Sylvia felt that something wasn't right. It wasn't like Bruce to go out that late. In fact, usually by then he was already asleep. The next day, around 8 a.m., Sylvia decided to go to their house. When she got there, she found Amy cleaning the white carpet on the stairs, which was common. Amy owned a carpet cleaning company and Sylvia was already used to seeing her cleaning the house. What she found odd was finding Bruce's wallet, cell phone, and favorite pair of sandals at the bottom of the stairs. The cell phone was Bruce's work tool and it was something he never left behind due to his gambling business. He asked Amy about it and she told the same story, that he had gone out at night and hadn't returned. The next day, still with no word from Bruce, Sylvia contacted the Las Vegas Police Department and reported him missing. The family didn't believe Amy's story about Bruce going out late at night, as he was a man of daytime habits and was usually in bed by nine. On July 7, 1996, frustrated by the police's slow investigations, Sylvia hired a private investigator named Michael Waisaki, who focused on the last person to see and speak to Bruce, Amy. When he interviewed her for the first time, she kept her story. On July 11th, when they spoke for the second time, she said she planned to leave the US and was looking for non-extradition countries. The very next day, she gave him a whole new version of what had happened to Bruce on the 9th of July 5th. According to Amy, four masked men had broken into the house, tied her up in the dining room and took Bruce to the bedroom where three of them beat and shot him. Before leaving with the body, they told her to keep her mouth shut and to clean up the mess. If anyone asked her about Bruce, she should say that he was out. As a last warning, they said they would be watching her 
and if she told anyone, they would kill her too. Searching the house, Michael found blood and a bullet hole on the other side of Bruce's bed mattress, immediately reported these new findings to the police. On July 15th, Amy was called to give a new statement. To the police, she claimed that, as Bruce was involved in illegal gambling, his death was linked with the mafia and add two new pieces of information, that the man had a New York accent and that she had just received a call from them the night before, July 14th, reminding her that she was being watched. What caught investigators' attention was that Amy had notes of what had happened on the night of the crime. In her defense, she stated that she always kept notes with her as it was a habit she had to keep all her company's issues in order. Police obtained warrants to search their house and cars, as well as the truck that belonged to Amy's company. They sprinkled lumino everywhere and found a trail of blood that started in the master bedroom, went down the stairs and ended into the foyer of the house. No murder weapon or cartridges were located and no blood stains on carpet fibers were found in any of the vehicles. They also began investigating Amy's relationship with her employee, Bobby Jones. Later on, the police discovered that Amy had purchased a safe in a local hotel, $35,000, gambling chips, and a bag of jewelry were found inside. At this point, even though Amy was the main suspect, they didn't have enough evidence to arrest her. On August 11, 1996, over two months after the crime, Bruce's body was found by two hunters in a town called Mesquite located in the U.S. state of Nevada, which is approximately an hour and 15 minutes northeast of Las Vegas, near the Arizona border. They saw the feet of a man in a shallow grave covered with stones in the desert north of the city. A 38 caliber shell was found inside the remains, which was later determined to be the cause of death. Ballistic tests could not be performed because of the condition the projector was in, due to acid that had been thrown on the body. The police went after Amy, but she had run away the same week she gave her last statement. They discovered that she had found Bruce's stash in the closet wall where he had written $135,000. An escape alert was issued by the police and Amy was now a fugitive. She didn't run away for long, but managed to get as far as Maryland, New Jersey, 3,000 kilometers from Las Vegas. According to the Daily News, she was stopped for speeding and when the police officer asked for her driver's license, Amy showed him her private parts with the intention of bribing him, not with money as people usually do, but with something else. The policeman didn't accept the offer and Amy was arrested. Upon searching the vehicle, police found $101,000 thrown in the back seat along with a passport, false documents, wigs, and the newspaper clipping that spoke of Bruce's disappearance. Amy was sent back to Nevada after spending two months in a Maryland prison. She told the police that she was terrified, that there were people following her, and that she had no one to turn to for help. As she had not been formally charged with Bruce's death, a bond of only $5,000 was set. Amy posted bail and fled again, managing to remain off police radar for over a year. On January 3, 1998, the story was featured in an episode of the TV show America's Most Wanted that was watched by millions of people. A short time later, police received a call from a man who said he saw Amy at a nudist camp called Sonier Palms in Florida. When they arrived at the campsite, they discovered that Amy had just left a few hours before and that she was using the name of Sandy Wade. On January 28, 1998, police discovered that Amy was at a friend's house in a town called Port St. Lucie, Florida, and arrested her. She had worked at several bars during her time on the run and lots of research materials on different extradition treaties of various countries with the United States were found inside her car. She was once again sent to Las Vegas and charged with murder, but this time without bail. Amy was the fugitive number 500 to be captured by the police after appearing on America's Most Wanted. A year later, a 38 caliber handgun was found in the desert outside of Las Vegas. That gun was traced back to Matthew Hunt, a friend of Bobby Jones' son. Amy's employee. The gun was quite rusty from exposure to the sun and rain, and it was not possible to say that it was the same gun linked to Bruce's case. However, it wasn't the same make and caliber as the one used to take his life. When Amy fled the authorities, Bobby Jones was accused of helping her to get Bruce's body out of the house, transport and bury it. 
He also fled Las Vegas after the crime, but was located and arrested a month later in the state of New Mexico and received a five-year sentence. According to authorities, Amy offered Bobby money to help her get rid of Bruce's body, and the motivation of the crime was a mansion that Bruce was building for his mother. Amy had asked him to put the house in her name, and he refused. At this refusal, Amy was furious and told him he didn't love her as he claimed. It was later discovered that Amy had always made sure to get something from all her past relationships. When they broke up, half of the men's assets went to her. During Amy's trial, prosecutors said she was a greedy woman who had only stayed with Bruce out of interest and that when Bruce threatened to end the relationship, she freaked out that she didn't want to lose her rich lifestyle and took his life. She continued to claim innocence and maintain her story about the mass intruders. A neighbor even testified at the trial and said that on the night of July 5th, he had heard three popping sounds, which at the time he thought were fireworks. Also during the trial, Al Levitt, a former detective, declared that Amy's story was a fairy tale. The jury took two days to reach a verdict. On December 18, 1998, Amy was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. In the year 2000, the Nevada State Supreme Court overturned the life sentence, claiming that the fairy tale comment unfairly influenced the jury. The prosecutor decided to make a deal with Amy. They said that if she confessed to second-degree murder, she would receive a sentence of 10 to 25 years in prison, discounting the time she had already served. On September 20, 2001, Amy accepted and signed the agreement. She had been in prison for three and a half years. In 2002, 76-year-old Sylvia White, her grandson, 22-year-old Mark Weinstein, and two others were arrested and charged with illegal gambling and racketeering. Agents broke into their home in the Las Vegas suburbs and found a directory with phones, some computers, bed and slips, and gaming panels. The family was estimated to have made thousands of dollars a week from illegal gambling. In July 2011, at 63 years old, after spending nearly 13 years in prison, Amy Deschamps was released. Well, folks, that's it. Thank you for watching until the end. Best wishes, and I see you next time.